to talk for like half an hour. Yeah. And then, um, so I think, you know, five minutes or so from you guys, and then we'll open it up for questions, and then we are just absolutely stopping at 1.15 because I have a class. I have a class. Oh, no, I don't have, I have a class at 3, I think. Are you here for yesterday's event? Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming. This is a panel on electoral systems, which is not a completely coincidental topic for today. Um, and we are going to try to lend something of a comparative law perspective on electoral systems. I want to remind you that this is part of a, a continuing series. On Wednesday, we will have a, a similar discussion at this time in this place on election 2008, what just happened, um, assuming we know what's happened by then. Um, on Thursday, we'll have one on the credit crisis, A View from the Street. Um, and then on Saturday, we have um, a conversation with Justice Anthony Kennedy um, at 11 a.m. in here, uh, assuming that unlike you know, eight years ago, um, Justice Kennedy isn't off having to decide who's president at the time. Um, so for today's panel on electoral systems, um, our primary presenter is going to be Professor Donald Horowitz on my far right, who is the James B. Duke Professor of Law and Political Science. Um, Professor Horowitz is an expert in, in comparative law. Um, he's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he is the author of a, a recent or forthcoming book called Constitutional Design, Many Architects, No Buildings. And we thought, you know, it would be particularly appropriate to have him since we've had relatively few architects in a really good building here. Um, we will have two commenters on the paper. Um, one by Ralph Michaels, immediately to my right, who is a professor of law here and the director of the Center of, for International and Comparative Law. Um, professor Michaels' research focuses on comparative law, conflict of laws, and, and global legal pluralism. Um, and then Guy Charles, who is visiting us from the University of Minnesota Law School, where he is the Russell M. and Elizabeth M. Bennett Professor of Law, is one of the country's leading, elect, uh, leading experts on election law and, and comments widely on constitutional law, campaign financing, redistricting, politics, and race. So um, we have a, you know, an, an excellent show for you, I think. Um, Professor Horwitz is, is going to talk for about half an hour, and then we will have two you know, brief comments by the other panelists. Um, and then open it up for your questions. I, just, just by way of introduction, I, I wanted to emphasize that although this is a, a comparative constitutional law panel, um, and it is dealing with a, a constitutional issue, that is, how is the government set up, how is the electoral process structured, um, I think we have an unfortunate tendency in, in this country to see these kinds of constitutional issues as set in constitutional stone and, and not subject to change easily. And, and that has, I think, the effect of diminishing interest in, in two important areas of constitutional law. One is the question of institutional design. If, if you're looking at something on the front end, how should you set up institutions to achieve the effects that you want? Um, and the second is comparative law. How much you know, should we look at other legal systems and figuring out what ours should be like. Neither of these things is, is very valuable in constitutional law if you think that whatever constitutional rules we have are set in stone and not subject to change. Why look at how other countries do it if we're pretty much stuck with the way that we do it? And, and so the, the single point that I want to try to make by way of introduction here is that a lot less of the constitutional rules governing the electoral system are actually set in stone by the document. If you think about some of the major features of the election today, the, the existence of political parties, how they choose candidates, how they structure themselves. Um, none of that's in the Constitution. It's, it's all changed um, fairly frequently over the course of our history. The first past the post election system, where we have single member district and, and winner take all elections, a fundamental feature of the electoral system, not in the Constitution, subject to change by ordinary law if we want to do so. Um, who votes? What are the qualifications for voters? How are they set aside into different districts for different candidates? None of that's in the Constitution either. And even things that are, are set in stone in the Constitution actually could be changed by ordinary means. If, if you think about the 
Electoral College, for instance. One of, of people's frequent discontents with our electoral system is the Electoral College. When I was um, on my great western trek with my two sons two years ago, we were sitting by the edge of the Grand Canyon waiting for sunset, and my son Michael, who's 10, started asking me questions about the Electoral College, and I, I tried to explain it to him. And at one point, he just burst into tears because he could not understand. It, I, it just could not be made to make sense to Michael how the Electoral College works. And I think that's a, a reaction that a lot of us have um, when we're confronted with the Electoral College. But what people don't understand um, is that the Electoral College could be overcome you know, through ordinary legislation. There is a proposed interstate compact on the Electoral College where states agree to commit their electoral votes to whoever wins the overall nationwide popular vote. And, and I think my calculations are correct that if the right nine states agreed to that interstate compact, then that would be decisive and we would effectively have done away with the Electoral College without a constitutional amendment. So, so the point of all this is simply to say that what Professor Horowitz and my other co-panelists are going to be talking about, the design of electoral systems, um, is actually a lot more up for grabs in this system as well. So if you th things you don't like about what goes down today, you should think about some of the alternatives that we'll be talking about. Professor Horowitz. Thank you. I have, I, have, I have one request, and that is that you not follow uh, uh, Michael Young's example and burst into tears if you don't understand what I have to say today. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, uh, it, 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 this stuff isn't so, isn't so simple, uh, but it is, I think, very interesting. Last Wednesday, I was a judge um, at our international food fiesta. We had six judges, and we had to decide um, on the best dish overall. Uh, but we quickly realized that there was more than one best dish overall, and we wanted to choose more than one, awarding first place to one and, and then some uh, runners up. We actually had tried 15 dishes, and when it came time to choose, someone said, let's just vote. Now, when Americans say, let's, let's just vote, they have something in particular in mind, but remember, we had a task that doesn't lend itself to choosing just uh, A or B. And in the end, what we decided to do uh, was to use a, a modified Borda method, that's B-O-R-D-A. I'm not going to bore you with Borda um, here today, but suffice it to say uh, that the Borda method has the virtue of recording a range of preferences and registering intensities of preference uh, uh, not just a single yes or no, and we could then very easily produce first, second, and third place winners. When Americans say, let's, let's just vote, what they usually mean is vote by what they call majority rule, or more correctly, plurality rule. Because, uh, let's forget for a moment about the presidential election. I know it's easy to forget today. So let's, let's think about legislative elections. And most of what I have to say today deals with legislative elections, although some of it transfers actually pretty easily to, to the choice of a single executive, if that's the system that you've got. When Americans talk about majority rule or plurality rule, what they mean is if there are multiple contestants, the contestant, the candidate, with the largest number of votes, even if it's short of 50%, will win. So let's stipulate that's, that's not properly called majority rule because there are actually systems that require a majority and not a plurality. It's plurality rule. And it's also called, as Professor Young said, first past the post. So now that we've got the terminology uh, straight, uh, I think we can talk uh, pretty clearly about this. Plurality rule or majority rule works just fine when there are two choices, A or B, although it also, you should bear in mind, tends to push choices in that bimodal form. And that's really the theme that I want to stress today, that the electoral system doesn't just register the choices that are before you, it actually constrains the choices before the choices are out there to choose. I'm gonna say more about that, uh, in fact, I'm gonna say a lot about that in the next half hour or so. When there are three or more than three possibilities, plurality rule can produce some very strange results. The most obvious of which is that more people may have voted against the winner than voted for the winner. Had the field been reduced to two candidates, you might have gotten a different result. Uh, this is a very important point to, again, that I'm going to 
come back to uh, uh, when, I, uh, when I discuss alternatives. You'll notice that plurality rule is deeply embedded, and it makes Americans uncomfortable even with some of their own deviant innovations, such as the Electoral College, because the results of, of, uh, of elections can seem illegitimate if nationally more people vote for the loser than for the winner. But the, these objections are not irrational. It's perfectly reasonable to say the person who got the largest number of votes nationally ought to win the election. But they do ignore the fact that there are many different ways to count votes rather than only one way involving an undifferentiated pool of voters nationwide. And the Electoral College, when it was uh, formulated, uh, had a lot to do with federalism uh, and with the desire to make sure that the largest states didn't simply get the choice of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, determining whom, uh, who was going to be elected president. So uh, we don't count Canadian votes, and we don't count Mexican votes. Um, uh, likewise, when we uh, uh, tally up the Electoral College, we compartmentalize for this purpose. Again, it's a debatable proposition. You could, you could like it or dislike it, but the point is there are many different ways to count votes within many different boundaries, uh, and that should be the starting point for analysis. I don't use this as a defense of the Electoral College. I use it only as an example, and in fact, I'm not going to say another word about the Electoral College after this. Some of you may know that there's an organization called Fair Vote that has been agitating around the country in favor of adopting any one of a variety of electoral systems, and its motto could very aptly be described as anything other than the Anglo-American plurality system. So that if a, a, a municipality um, or a state adopts a different system from the plurality system, Fair vote says that's a victory for a fair vote, regardless of what system has been adopted, because fair vote has decided uh, that uh, anything but the, uh, uh, the plurality system is good. It's had some local successes. But uh, these local successes are not necessarily to be commended, because they've been adopted without knowledge of the full range of their likely effects. And those effects can really be profound. When you adopt an electoral system, you don't just say, gee, this looks good, let's, let's, let's go for it. You really need to figure out what the likely effects are going to be, given the configuration of social cleavages in your jurisdiction, uh, and given uh, the, the political party uh, situation. Uh, as Professor Young mentioned, I'm writing a book on comparative constitutional design, and I want to think about, uh, I want to talk about how to think about one piece of it here, which is to say electoral system adoption. The electoral system is actually in some constitutions, um, but whether it's actually in the constitution or whether it's in legislation, uh, it's surely part of the constitution beyond the constitution, uh, to borrow a phrase from our moderator. So let me begin with an illustration. Back in 2004, I got an urgent email. Uh, <clears throat> from some international advisors in Afghanistan whom I'd, I'd helped before on a, on a completely different question, a question having to do with constitutional courts. But now what was on their mind was the choice of the electoral system for Afghanistan. They, these international advisors had been pushing for a proportional system, but the Afghans had rejected that advice, and they had somehow heard about a system called the Single Non-Transferable Vote, SNTV. What the alarmed internationals wanted to know was SNTV, and what effects would it likely have in Afghanistan? So let me tell you just very quickly what SNTV is. Uh, in a legislature that has a lot of multi-member constituencies, that is to say what we call districts, with several legislators elected at large from the district, from each of those districts, each voter gets one vote. In other words, you get fewer votes than the number of people to be elected. That's the single part of it, and it's non-transferable. That is, it's not a preferential ballot. You just get to say which of the 40 candidates running, uh, you want to elect to one of the 10 seats, for example. Now, I told them that SNTV was a system that was previously used in Japan and Korea. It was still used at the time in Taiwan. It's no longer used there. It's well studied. It's well known to produce 
a whole series of results, personalistic politics. It's a kind of popularity contest in the constituency, as you could easily imagine. Pork barrel politics, uh, intra-party rivalries and factions, and it's likely to be pretty strongly unconducive to, uh, to national, coherent national policy making. It's a very localistic uh, system. And then I said, well, why do they want SNTV? And the answer was that they feared that proportional representation by, na by lists, uh, which I'll, I guess maybe I ought to deal with right now. Um, let me tell you what the alternative was that they were pushing. It's up here on the board. Uh, it's called List System PR, where each, each party uh, produces a list which can be as large, as long as the number of seats to be elected. So in National List PR, suppose there are 100 seats, each party produces a, hundred, a list of 100 candidates. And then the top candidates, by percentage, get, uh, get elected. You just vote for the list, not for the candidate. So if the A party has 100 candidates and it gets half of the votes, then the top 50 of its candidates will be elected. If the B party has, four, uh, uh, has 100 candidates and it, gain, and it gets 40% of the votes, its top 40 names will be elected. And if the C party gets 10%, why its top 10 names will be elected. This is list system PR. It's a very commonly used system. So that was the alternative that was being pushed by the uh, international uh, advisors. The Afghans didn't like it because they were afraid that determining the order on the list was everything, and they were right about that. Party leaders typically determine the order of candidates on the list, and they therefore determine who gets a safe seat and who doesn't. What they were trying to do in Afghanistan was to kill the power of the warlords. Remember the warlords in Afghanistan? The warlords formed political parties, and they would determine the order of candidates on the list. The constitution makers in Afghanistan, who were also choosing the electoral system, hated the warlords, uh, and therefore they wanted a more localistic system. They wanted SNTV. I, I wrote back, and I said, I, I thought on these grounds that SNTV wasn't a crazy choice. Uh, it doesn't have a great history in the countries in which it was used, but for this purpose, it might just have uh, some efficacy. Well, uh, one election later, the warlords were still strong, uh, but they might, I like to console myself, they might have had an even stronger grip with list system PR. The narrow moral of the story is commonplace. Choose an electoral system to suit local conditions, local problems, local tastes, and not to suit international fashions, and certainly not to suit international advisors. The broader moral is simple enough, but not widely known. It's certainly not widely known in this country. There are many electoral systems that can do what electoral systems are supposed to do, convert votes into seats in the legislature, and can do so while meeting a variety of standards of fairness. List system PR is one of those, uh, one of those systems. It meets certain standards of fairness. Other, uh, other systems can meet other standards of fairness as well. There's one thing, however, that an electoral system cannot do, and that is reflect the will of the people as such. I'll gulp on my water while you gulp on your lunch after that sentence. <clears throat> Let me repeat. The one thing an electoral system cannot do is simply reflect the pre-existing will of the people. There is no system that simply registers the raw preferences of the electorate. If your idea of electoral democracy is to record faithfully what the voters want, that's just not possible. Every electoral system shapes or constrains the alternatives available to voters in one way or another. For example, by creating incentives for more uh, parties to form or for fewer parties to form. And so the merely mechanical registration of preferences is not among the policy choices available to electoral system designers. Elect electoral systems aggregate preferences. No system can simply do a passive translation of individual choices into outcomes. Now I've said it about four different ways, and at, at least, uh, uh, at, at least I, I, I hope you've heard it four different ways. Once you know this, that every electoral system has its biases, that every electoral system shapes preferences, shapes the party configuration, and importantly, shapes social cleavages, then you can ask which of these biases you prefer.
This is just another way of saying that the process of choosing an institution involves a preference for the effects its biases are likely to create. That's not the way institutions are usually chosen. Let me tell you how they're really chosen, and chosen really in quotation marks. They're chosen, first of all, by a combination in new countries of cultural or colonial affinity. They're also chosen because they come, in some cases, from conspicuously successful democracies. They come, uh, they're chosen in other cases because of the biases of international bureaucrats and advisors. Increasingly, that means list system PR because that's what the international advisors tend to like. And of course, not to be neglected, they are chosen by the interests of those who do the choosing, often political party leaders. But let me come back to the first point, and I'm going to show you a graphic demonstration of the first point cultural or, more importantly, colonial affinity. If You can't see this very well, I know, this map of electoral systems around the world. But you can see the colors. And if you look at the red colors, you will be seeing, for the most part, former British colonies. I'll show it to you in a minute. Former British colonies. Here's India, for instance. Here's the Sudan. For the most part, former British colonies. Oh, and by the way, here's one right here a set of former British colonies, the United States. We inherited this thing. We didn't choose it. We inherited first past the post. Look at the red. Uh, if you look, by the way, at, at the blue spots in Africa, you will see um, Francophone, former French colonies. And strangely enough, they tend to have the French electoral system, red. <laughs> so that's how they're really chosen. So bear in mind that it's not always just a deliberate a process. Nevertheless, if you know what you want, you can design an electoral system to achieve it. About 15 years ago, I wrote a book on South Africa, and I had a chapter in it called Electoral Systems for Divided Societies. The book was reviewed by an Oxford philosopher by the name of Sir Michael Dummett, who was a very great expert on the mathematics of electoral systems. And he said nice things about the book. He said, it's a good book. You can learn some things from this book. He said, but when it comes to electoral systems, Horowitz is a supermarket shopper. He takes them off the shelf. By which he meant that I wasn't going to design a, specific, a specifically configured system, as Dummett would have designed, for the particular problems that were identified in the book. He certainly wouldn't have proceeded the way I did, but then again, uh, Sir Michael Dummett doesn't have to deal with politicians in countries designing electoral systems who are exceedingly risk averse to begin with, don't want to choose anything strange, and cer certainly don't want to choose anything specifically configured from scratch for their particular problem. So here are a few things that policymakers in a variety of countries might want. I'm going to lay out a half dozen of them. They might want proportionality of seats to votes. If a party gets 30% of the votes, it ought to get 30% of the seats, according to this view. Proportionality is not a trivial goal, and, but it's one that tends to capture a lot of others once you think about it. Secondly, they might want accountability of candidates to the voters. You notice in list system PR, the accountability is to the party leaders. And in list system PR systems, the legislators who have been elected merely on a list and not chosen by, as individuals by the voters, don't generally tend to care much about their constituents. What they care about is their position on the list. And to keep their position on the list high, they tend to cultivate party leaders. So notice that proportionality and accountability are sometimes at odds. So this is the beginning of wisdom in this field, that you can't have everything. Third, you might want durable governments rather than unstable coalitions. If you have a fragmented society and you have list PR, you may have a lot of different parties. They may, ha they may have to form coalitions in order to govern, and the coalitions may be unstable. If you like, want durable governments, you might, under these conditions, choose some other system. Fourth, you might want the victory of the Condorcet winner. Just hold the thought. It's written on the board there. I'll come back to it before I'm done. A lot of theorists of electoral systems like the victory of the Condorcet winner, and I confess that I do too. Fifth, in an, in an ethnically or religiously divided society, you might want uh, to promote intergroup conciliation, compromise, accommodation. And sixth, uh, you might want to promote minority office holding. 
which is not necessarily the same thing as, as intergroup conciliation. Many other goals are possible. I just lay out these six because they're six common ones around the world. So let me say a few words about each of these goals and how they might be achieved. Proportionality of seats to votes. National list system PR makes the whole country one constituency and parties put up lists uh, and, the, and the votes are tallied in the way in which I have described. It was that, by the way, that created very great instability in Iraq because the first elections were held by national list system PR you may remember that the Sunnis boycotted the first election and therefore ended up with very, very few seats in comparison to the number of seats they might have elected uh, under a different system. As a matter of fact, had provincial list, list PR been utilized, then it wouldn't have mattered how many Sunnis voted. In those provinces that are majority Sunni, there would have been Sunni representatives elected. But because the lists were national, the boycott combined with nationalists produced a ter terrific underrepresentation of Sunnis and a great alienation of Sunnis from the, uh, from the political system thereafter. But there are other ways to do it. There, you can do, as I say, constituency list, provincial list, and so on. There's another proportional system that's a constituency-based system called the single transferable vote. I'm not going to tax you with that. Don't worry. Uh, but it's another way to achieve proportionality, if that's what you want, with some constituent accountability. Not as much as you would get under first past the post, but some. But remember, proportionality is only one goal, and it often conflicts with the others. If you opt for per perfect proportionality, what you want, if that's, what, if that's all you want, then you want national list PR with no threshold for a party to be represented. That is to say, if there are 100 seats, any party that gets 1% of the vote will get 1% of the seats. If it's 100, uh, a list of 100, its top person will be elected. You'll get perfect proportionality, uh, but you'll also get, under most conditions, very great party fragmentation because this will create great incentives for very small parties to emerge, reflecting particular social cleavages. They can get seats. Uh, and small parties tend to represent narrow interests, so you will uh, un very likely, under such a system, proliferate and magnify social cleavages. So you say, oh, well, we don't have to do that. Let's create a threshold. Let's say that you have to get 5% in order to get any representation at all. And then you, if you got 5%, you'd get five seats. You have to be careful when you set the threshold. You can set it too low, you can set it too high. If you set it too high, you can create some really bizarre results. In Turkey, the threshold is 10 percent. As it happens, a couple of elections ago in Turkey, in a fragmented party system, a lot of parties got a significant number of votes but didn't cross the 10 percent threshold. Now, a party with 8 percent in a fragmented society is a significant party but it got zero seats because the threshold was 10%. And as a matter of fact, 40% of, of the votes of the voters elected nobody in Turkey in that election. And the party that came to power, the AKP, the Islamic rooted party, gained a very large majority of seats on a small plurality of votes. At the opposite extreme, uh, take the case of Israel with a 2% threshold a very low threshold. Very small parties can make or break coalitions under these conditions, and so they have blackmail power. The irony of this kind of system is that the more perfectly proportionate the electoral outcome, and they're very proportionate in Israel, the more disproportionate the policy outcomes are, because the smallest parties get a disproportionate share of the good things the government has to offer. Otherwise, the coalition will fall. So setting the threshold is a tricky business. Second, account of, I'm coming back to those half dozen goals that I, that I laid out at the outset. Accountability of party leaders to the electorate. Constituencies, of course, are best for this. Nationalist PR is worst for this. Constituent lists are good for this. Uh, but notice that there can be also uh, uh, some trade-offs involved here too. And I, I, don't, I think I'm, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip a description of exactly what those trade-offs are. Third, durable governments. That is, governments that don't fall uh, every other month. Uh, 
For durable governments, the Anglo-American plurality system is pretty good. It aggregates interests within parties because each candidate needs to get to a plurality to win. In a PR system, several parties may aggregate interests after the elections. That is to say, they may form a coalition uh, after the elections. And that's not a very big problem uh, in societies where differences are just differences of opinion rather than differences of ways of being, where there aren't severe ethnic or uh, religious differences. Even so, pre-electoral aggregation is generally more likely to reduce differences than post-electoral aggregation. So first past the post is said to be, to be a centripetal system. That is, it produces a move toward the center. It produces catch-all parties. It produces candidates who move toward the center. Um, a list system proportional representation is said to be a centrifugal system. It contains incentives for parties to differentiate themselves by moving their positions away from the political center. Later on, they can worry about whether they are going to join a government. Now, you might like first past the post, the Anglo-American system, because you like a durable government. I'm now talking as if this were a parliamentary system. And you might like it because of its generally centripetal character. That is, it encourages a lot of compromise. But be careful, because you're paying a price for this. First past the post tends to give the largest party, or even the largest two parties, what's called a seat bonus. That is, we know from, from quantitative studies that a party with 48% of the vote in a, in a country with, which has some three-way contests, a party with 48% of the popular vote is guaranteed to have more than a majority of seats because of recurrent victories in three-way contests. So first past the post produces disproportional results. But some part of those results is also and don't neglect this, is also usually the product of constituency malapportionment. That is, if you have a constituency system, one thing you want to be sure of uh, is that the constituencies are more or less equal. The Supreme Court told us that about, well, it's now almost 50 years ago. And an honest demarcation of constituencies will sometimes be a problem. In some developing countries, it can be a big problem because the government in power will try to manipulate the, the demarcation of constituencies to favor uh, its own supporters. And then fourth, the victory of the Condorcet winner. The Condorcet winner is the candidate, uh, it's, this is named after the Mar Marquis de Condorcet in the 18th century, he thought up this criterion, I think it's a pretty interesting one. It's, the Con Condorcet winner is the candidate who beats every other candidate in a head-to-head -head contest. Now, if you have more than two candidates, in many systems, the Condorcet winner can lose. Let me show you. Let's take a first-past-the-post, an American election, in a, any, a congressional election, where there are three candidates. Where X, this is on the board too, where X gets 45% of the vote, Y gets 40% of the vote, and Z gets 15% of the vote. You notice the winner in that, in, 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 under the Anglo-American system is X. He's, got, he's the plurality winner. But let's drop out Z. Let's suppose it were only X against Y. And let's suppose that those people who support Z would, if Z weren't running, would uniformly support Y. Then, the, in the head-to-head -head contest, you notice that Y defeats X by 55 to 45. Y is actually the Condorcet winner because he can defeat the other candidates in a head-to-head -head contest, but Y has lost in the plurality contest. Now, why do we care about this? Well, the Condorcet winner is likely to be the second choice of those, those voters for whom he's not the he or she is not the first choice. And that also means that the Condorcet winner is likely to be a moderate. And again, if you think a centripetal system is better than a centrifugal system, you'll like the, the criterion of the Condorcet winner. Fifth, interethnic conciliation. This, the, rest the rest of this won't take that long, I assure you. Interethnic conciliation. In a divided society, there's a big question. Do you want conciliation before the election, or do you want conciliation after the election? 
There's a big debate in the literature on this. Some people say post-electoral conciliation is just fine. Use list system PR. Let parties form ethnically. Let them then resolve their differences after the election. The problem is that when parties are ethnic, there's no incentive in list system PR to inter-ethnic moderation because uh, you can get elected on the votes of your own group alone. You don't need to get a plurality. You don't need to get a majority. You don't need the votes of anybody other than members of your own group. So I I've taken the other side in this debate. I've argued for systems with higher thresholds for victory or for distribution requirements. Try this one. I don't want to get into the higher thresholds for victory because they involve some mathematics that we don't have time for here. But try this one. Take the case of the Nigerian presidential system. Nigeria is a country that has big ethnic divisions and it had big conflicts. And in 1978, uh, the Nigerians had a, a constituent assembly that redid the constitution. And in, although it had problems thereafter, this piece of the constitution remains intact. To be elected president of Nigeria, you have to have a plurality, that is the largest number of votes, plus at least 25% of the vote in no fewer than two-thirds of the states. Now, why this complicated set of requirements, plurality plus geographic distribution? Well, because if it were plurality alone, the largest group, the House of Fulani, could easily win every election because parties would tend to be organized al along ethnic lines. And that's what got Nigeria into its problems in the first place. But the distribution requirement means that none of the three largest groups, Hausa, uh, Yoruba, Igbo, can win the election alone. And as a matter of fact, no two of them can win the election alone. What has to happen uh, is that deals have to be made across the country for minority support. So here's a system that requires more than just plurality in the interest of interethnic conciliation. And as I say, there are several systems that can foster inter-ethnic conciliation. It's not all that hard to do. Um, this debate about what the right system is for inter-ethnic conciliation is by no means over, uh, but there's some evidence that inter-ethnic conciliation is a likely product uh, of, the, uh, of an electoral system that makes victory dependent on forging inter-ethnic support before elections, and if you want, in the question period, I can give you some of that evidence. Finally, if on the other hand, you simply want minority office holding and you have ethnically based parties, proportional representation is probably what you want. PR will tend to reflect ethnic cleavages. But I've argued that this just gets you coalitions of opposites in divided societies, and it doesn't get you inter-ethnic conciliation. So once again, you have a question of, uh, of, uh, of trade-offs. Now, there's one issue here, just a small issue. Well, it's not at all a small issue. I've just, uh, uh, I, 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 just, I just said that for rhetorical purposes. There's one issue uh, here that I've, uh, that I've neglected. It's the problem of adoptability. So far, we've been, we've been supposing an ideal world in which we choose, we, 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 we diagnose our problems, and we choose a system that's appropriate to those problems. But alas, there is the small problem of adoptability. There are politicians out there. Politicians have interests, and they also have their own biases, and they also have their own inherited traditions. And uh, that's where uh, the subtitle of that book that Professor Young um, mentioned uh, comes into play, Many Architects, No Buildings. Uh, there, this, uh, you, you, um, the politicians usually don't ask the question in the way in which I've asked it. They don't say, what's our problem and is there a system that can help us with it? Or can we devise a system that can help, uh, can help us with this, uh, to, to take the, uh, the view of uh, Sir Michael Dummett? They say instead, what system should we adopt? What system should we adopt? This gets it backwards because it omits that whole first inquiry. You should ask first, what do we want to achieve uh, and then, let it, are there ways to achieve it? And will we, will we be able to uh, more or less achieve it? And then you have to say, but what are the obstacles uh, to, to actually adopting it? So be clear on what you want. Don't rule out systems a priori. And that includes the Anglo-American first-past-the-post system that has sustained the two longest-lived democracies in the world and the largest democracy in the world, which is India. Thank you.
Well, I will and should be brief because speaking after one of the world's leading experts on election systems would be daunting for anyone, even more so for me. I'm a comparative lawyer, which suggests to people I may not know anything about a specific subject, but once I start comparing it, maybe something still comes out of it. Um, I will indeed do that. I will offer the first um, quality that a comparative lawyer should have, which is amazement and interest when he gets to strange and foreign countries and the attempt to understand those legal systems. And that strange and foreign countries I'm talking about is, of course, the United States. Um, and the point where I want to start and dabble just a little is Don's extremely interesting and relevant point to say there is no real neutrality in election. That is, there may be different choices to be made in setting up an electoral system, and those choices are going to be um, policy choices, and they require determination of what policies should actually be furthered. Now, that raises the next question, obviously, and there's a question, who makes those choices? That is, who actually decides where we go, how we count votes, which was the focus of this talk, but also who gets to vote, how do we um, allocate districts, etc. Who makes those roles? And, and that's, in fact, the strangest thing, perhaps, coming from Europe to the United States, to see who actually makes these roles. The first thing that's obviously strange is that in federal elections, we have a non-federal administration. But federal elections are largely administered by the states. That's not something um, I want to mention here. But the other thing that is really striking from the outside is how privatized elections are. How much in the process of elections in the United States is um, governed privately, and that means on a partisan basis. That is either by the parties or by supporters of the parties as opposed to the state or some other third neutral um, institution. That's obviously true in um, the definition of voter districts. We have gerrymandering in many countries, but nowhere as absurd as we do um, in this country, where the idea that the governing party would, under certain constraints, be relatively free to design districts in order to assure their re-election goes far, far further than it would be in other countries, where we have far more restrictive rules, as I understand it, on something like gerrymandering. That's true for voter registration. I went to the restrooms before this talk, which one always should do, of course, in order to find the multimedia for the talk, which is not registered, not a problem. <laughs> now, not registered, of course, <clears throat> is a problem. Registered sometimes is a problem, too. We've read about ACORNs registering people by the name of Mickey Mouse, etc., which we considered a scandal. The biggest scandal from a European perspective is why a private group like ACORN should be in charge of this in the first place. Why we would have actual private groups with quite frequently partisan, not necessarily, but quite frequently partisan interests in the business of registering as opposed to finding some um, state determined way in which registry in some registers, for example, automatically turns into registration for votes. So we would take some of that out of it. And then thirdly, obviously, the administration of elections themselves, which um, in parts of the United States is done by openly partisan state and local officials. Again, something that looks strange from the outside, looking from a different country, where the hope is that those administering these elections are much more neutral, have much less of a stake in the outcome <coughs> um, as the parties themselves. The, um, the, the, the Florida events in 2000, where both sides were uh, discussing and actually making choices almost entirely on the basis, it seemed, of uh, partisan preferences, is a systemic problem. It's a problem in a system in which those choices are made by partisans. Now, a consequence, it seems to me, of such a system is that all issues, it should be just um, policy choices become partisan issues, and in a two-party system, all preferences are likely to be antagonistic. That is, the public, any policy choice will favor one party and disfavor the other party, and for that reason will be viewed not as a rule to improve the system, but a rule to improve the position of one party and um, uh, weaken the position of the other party. When we talk about voter regist registrations, then Democrats are accused of fake registrations and Republicans are accused of suppressing the vote. Why? 
Obviously, no one, would, no one should want fake registrations. No one should want suppression of the vote. But these things tend to turn into um, partisan preferences. The same is true in administration of elections. Indeed, one of the most puzzling things from the outside in a case like Bush v. Gore is the case name. Why the case name? Because it seems that the candidates themselves fight over this issue as though it is a partisan issue, as though it should be viewed as a privately litigated, privately disputed contest between um, Bush on the one hand, Gore on the other hand, instead of a neutral administration of rules. How would that um, litigation look in another country? You would not have an individual on the other side, especially you would not have a candidate on the other side. You would have to sue the state. You would have to sue the um, institutions that actually administer the elections. So there is, <clears throat> to conclude, because I did say I want to be um, very brief, there is one strange thing in, in the American election, and one that it seems to me creates much of the tension, much of the um, overblown rhetoric that we have in elections, where there is no neutral or neutrally administered center from which, our, from which these elections are actually um, determined. In, a, in an officially administered system, you have to, in order to contest elections, you have to prove bias on the side of officials. And of course, in many countries, we have a lot of that bias. But at least you, we may have the assumption of the absence of bias. In a system in which the, many of the rules are, administ by, uh, are administered by those wanting to profit from the elections themselves, we don't even have the assumption that there is the absence of bias. Rather, we assume there to be bias on the other side, and we want to hold these people to some neutral standard. And then the crucial thing to me that comes out from Don's presentation, if there is no neutral standard, that is, if the determination of a standard itself is a policy choice, then this whole endeavor of trying to hold them to some neutral standard is going to fail. So, the plea from a European side would be for neutral administrators of um, elections, not because we have neutral standards and only neutral administrators could actually make sure that those are um, kept, but quite the opposite. Because we do not have such neutral standards in the first place, the way of deciding about these policies would, he would have to be detached as far as possible from the elections themselves. That is, we need these neutral administrators because their legitimacy is likely to be higher or likely to be um, perceived to be higher than the legis legitimacy of the contestants in the elections um, themselves. That's a very amateurish observation, but that's um, as much as I can do. I too will be brief as there isn't much to add after uh, the expert has spoken. Uh, but since I have been asked to speak and I must do so in English, I guess I must say something. Um, so here it goes. Uh, part of what's interesting about this process is to think about, as Don started, why electoral systems are important. And it seems to me that this is a question that lawyers should particularly be interested in because really electoral systems are the lawyer's minefield in some respects, but also the lawyer's playground. Um, so the first lesson, and I'll summarize and be very brief, the first lessons, lesson is that rules are important to legislative outcomes, right? And this is a, a lesson that I think uh, legal uh, budding lawyers learn, if not the very first week of law <laughs> school, certainly by the end of the first semester. The importance of rules and the determinativeness of rules. The second lesson is that rules um, and electoral structures are determinative of public policy outcomes. So they're just not important to the legislative outcomes, but if you really care about public policy, you really ought to care about the design and structure of electoral systems. And then the last lesson is the importance of trade-offs, right? That you cannot have, as Don ended his talk, you cannot have all of the values that you really want. You have to trade off between and among values. And here, which is, this is the interesting part that's, that, that's uh, the American system, um, to pick you back of some of the, uh, a point that Ralph was making earlier, um, who does the trade-off? And, and this will be my contribution to, to this panel, 
What's interesting about the American system is that for the most part, trade-offs are done by courts, right? In particular, the Supreme Court, as you saw at the end of the day with Bush v. Gore, um, but mainly by courts. So a couple examples, um, and then I'll stop. The one person, one vote rule, right? That is a rule that talked about that, that the Supreme Court came up with. It's not in the Constitution. So for example, if you read a number of the cases, um, Reynolds v. Sims, Baker v. Carr, the cases that are relevant to this line of inquiry, um, the court wants you to believe that this rule directly comes down from the 14th Amendment. Um, but of course, if you read the 14th Amendment and you read the legislative debates, et cetera, you see nothing in there that tells you, well, equality means one person, one vote. But it's a necessary rule in order to make sense of this process, this design of electoral systems that we have, and to make it workable so that way there could will can impose some fairness onto the process. Um, another rule that's an example is the right of association for political parties. Um, as Professor Young mentioned, you don't see political parties in the Constitution, um, but yet they have a First Amendment right of association. So without political parties, without and you can't make sense of the electoral system design that we in fact have. And again, these rules come from the court as the moderator um, of values and the entity that makes the choice uh, as to what sorts of values can be represented by the system that we have. And one can go on and talk about racial gerrymandering, gerrymandering um, the interests of political actors to design systems that benefit them as opposed to Voters. So what's interesting about the American electoral construct um, is the role that um, judicial institutions play in deciding and moderating the various value choices that we, in fact, have not made, the value choices that have come down to us either from a colonial perspective or simply because as uh, we've evolved into this process and it's been handed down that we assume that it's the only system that we in fact can use, yet there are choices that, that are important choices that need to be made and most of those choices are being made by courts and less of them are made um, by judicial, excuse me, less of them are made by legislative actors and the way that one would think uh, ex ante legislative actors would get together and decide what values ought, ought to be represented in the system and how to make those uh, trade-offs and policy choices. Thank you. So we have a few minutes for questions. Anyone? Bueller? There. Uh, putting aside the issue of adoptability, um, what do you gentlemen think would be the best system for the United States right now? There's a, a small question for you. <laughs> Thanks. <Yeah. Anytime. laughs> well, there's something else I didn't say, uh, and, that's, and that's this. Um, if you have something that's working reasonably well, you ought to be relatively risk averse about changing it because unforeseen consequences are an integral part of this, of this process. Uh, so I made it sound as if, if you know exactly what you want, you can choose a system to get to it. But that was, that was simply for, for purposes of heuristic uh, simplicity. The truth is that, that, that there are a lot of unforeseen consequences around, let me give you one great example of it, and that has to do with the single non-transferable vote. Remember the, Af the system that Afghanistan adopted for its legislature. Because it's a popularity contest and because you only get one vote, a lot of people just vote for, for, the, for the most prominent member of their clan. <clears throat> and the result is that there are multiple candidates for those, let's say, 10 seats in every constituency. Maybe there are 50 candidates. And it becomes possible for someone to be elected with only 10% of the vote. So you, get, you, get, you can get a very strange fragmentation of uh, representation uh, with, with, with SNTV. I give you that example only to show you that, that what started out with a perfectly benign purpose ends up with a, with a truly terrible uh, set of consequences. And the same might be true here. So I'd be really careful about changing the system. I think first past the post has worked pretty well for the United States. Um, I, I'd, I'd, uh, um, I'd, I'd probably think, begin to think favorably about a change in the Electoral College because uh, the, electoral, the conditions that gave rise to the creation of the Electoral College initially uh, no longer exist in quite the same form. You rem remember that at the, 
convention, there was a great fear on the part of the small states of the large states, and that gave rise to the equally apportioned Senate. Um, the thought was that if the, popular, uh, if the popular vote determined the outcome of the presidency, the large states would simply swamp the small states. Uh, this, uh, this fear, I think, is now, has now dissipated to a considerable degree, and people's state identifications are now, uh, with geographic mobility, much less prominent than they, than they once were. But bear this in mind, if we abolish the Electoral College tomorrow, and we opted for election of the president with popular vote, there'd be a different set of consequences. You wouldn't get rid of the, of the battleground states. It's just that their identity would change. The, the big battleground states would be the biggest states where the, where the largest pool of votes were, were to be had. You wouldn't, you wouldn't get rid of one of the negative consequences, which is that, that if you don't live in a battleground state, well, I was going to say the campaign passes you by, but that's not possible in this campaign. The campaign can't pass you by, couldn't have passed you by. But there are some people who think that, uh, that it's important that, that, that uh, people in every state uh, have some sense that they're actually choosing the president, whereas in, in states that are identified with one party or another, they're not choosing the president. But that it would still be the case that there would be some, some states that would be the key battleground states, and, and, and other people living in other states would feel relatively neglected because their partisan identification uh, would be already known and because there would be relatively few votes uh, to be had there. So um, I, I, I'm not... I'm, I'm, I'm not averse to the status quo with respect to legislative elections. I'd, I'd certainly want much better constituency delimitation than we have for reasons that Professor Michaels adverted to. I, I, I like uh, uh, detached uh, electoral commissions, and I, I would like to see if they could be made to work for this purpose. Uh, and as to the Electoral College, I'm sort of agnostic. A um, couple quick comments. I, I, I think I'd prefer to see a little bit more proportionality than we, in fact, have. So uh, this goes back to something that Don has said. Essentially, the system that we have brings, uh, brings the electorate into sort of two, um, two camps, right? But what happens to folks who are um, you know, politi economically liberal, socially conservative, you know, socially conservative, economic liberal, et cetera, right? The full spectrum is not represented. And so we have... Um, structures that impose um, electoral outcomes or electoral views on the electorate that are not represented, that are not representative in some sense. Now, it's, it's, in some ways, it's a trick in the neck to say, well, what's representative and what's not. But nevertheless, we have a sense that we have a broader electorate than that is in fact being represented. And I think that's that's an issue that one ought to think about, especially as the electorate becomes a lot more diversified. Um, and on the electoral college. Um, you know, one of the things that is interesting about this presidential election, as expensive and as difficult as it has been, it, to me it shows the strengths in some or one strength of the Electoral College. Um, can you imagine how expensive an election would be if you, in fact, had to relatively compete in just about every single state? And I agree with Schiff, the battlegrounds a little bit. Um, but nevertheless, uh, given how close an, an election it it might be or it could be. Um, you couldn't afford to take any state for granted. And what the, electro what the Electoral College does is it, it shrinks the, the geography quite a bit. And, and that has you know, some drawbacks, but one benefit that it has um, is as much as, as money as has been spent, uh, it certainly wouldn't be enough if the electorate um, was in fact much uh, the whole country. So I think there are some benefits to the Electoral College in this environment. Um, now, whether you like that or not is, again, the question of, of trade-offs. Time for one more. Anyone? Well, help me thank our panelists.